Hello and welcome to this video where I'm going to be introducing you to a study that I did and published back in 2018 and then I updated it back in uh, 2020 and the study is called Metacosm and this is the copy of it here in my hands I'm just showing you what the cover looks like and it's a study that explores the Bible book order and how I believe that it is divinely inspired by God himself, that it shows thematically, book by book, the progression of a believer's life from being lost in a fallen world to salvation, to sanctification, to glorification, and all the steps in between all the way to eternity. And it does this in three iterative patterns found in the history, which is what I'm going to be sharing with you today, that's the book of Genesis through the book of Esther, which is Israel's history. And then it also repeats itself again through the prophets with Isaiah through Malachi, another exact uh, contiguous 17-stage progression. And then it does it again in the epistles, Romans through Second Peter, another exact 17-stage progression in Bible book order, canonical Bible book order. And so uh, many people, unfortunately, believe, even very spirit-filled Bible scholars and teachers throughout history, they've incorrectly believed and been taught that the Bible's order is just happenstance, that it was kind of randomly thrown together by committees and councils, and it just somehow randomly ended up in the order that we have it in today. And that is, I believe, completely incorrect, and I want to help completely dispel that belief and that view by demonstrating that God actually has a divine order in mind with the way that the Bible is presented. And so uh, one of the arguments that I make on this is, is, uh, is that people believe that they study in history and they see things like Stephen Langton in 1205 AD um, enumerated the chapter breaks in the Bible. And that's an academic understanding, and that in 1555 AD, um, Robert Estienne, also known as Robert Stephanus, um, enumerated the verse divisions in that uh, time, 1555 AD, he finalized it, and then the canonical book order kind of changed over the centuries, and then uh, finally, it just came out in uh, 1611, the, the English version that we have uh, came out, um, the authorized version, and that by that time, all the chapters and verses were there, and the Bible book order was there, but none of those things are from divine origin. That's what is taught, and that is what is believed by many, unfortunately. However, uh, one of my studies um, that... I started with this project was Isaiah, a biblical microcosm, showing how the book of Isaiah outlines the Bible with its 66 chapters mirroring the 66 books of the Bible. And a lot of people from an academic or intellectual uh, background uh, pushed back on that idea saying, oh no, that's just a coincidence. And I've uh, spent uh, the better part of the past 22 years uh, as a Bible teacher, also as an author, uh, authoring these studies that the Lord has led me to do, and basically proving um, unequivocally that that's a false notion. And it's kind of like saying that um, a great artist, like for instance Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci or somebody like that, like Michelangelo, um, had all of these um, paintings for the Sistine Chapel, and then he just walked away from it and let other people randomly throw them up on the ceiling wherever they felt was best. And obviously that's um, a uh, facetious statement. I'm just being sarcastic there. Uh, because obviously he wouldn't do that. He had a plan uh, for the whole picture, the whole, all of the paintings and every aspect of them were designed and planned out in advance and where they were going to be placed up on the, the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel. It was going to be divinely um, 
not divinely, but orchestrated by him, the 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 artist himself. He wasn't going to let somebody else randomly throw up his stuff wherever they felt it would it would fit best. And you could apply this to any artist or any architect. Um, you know, it would be like saying somebody, some uh, genius architect, uh, put together some different rooms uh, in this structure, and then he just let somebody else come and throw it all together however they felt was best. Well, think about that analogy with God. Do you think God was going to um, have his perfect holy word and that he was just going to turn it over to random people to throw together in the way that they thought was best? Uh, and the answer to that is obviously no. And I'm going to try to prove that to you today in this study. And I've done this study uh, before in a video format. And um, I know there's a lot of new people to the channel. And I haven't done it in a while. And I know a lot of people, uh, even though the video's there uh, these days, unfortunately, a lot of people won't watch unless it's fresh, unless it's a few days old or, or less or a week or so old. That's the, uh, They want to watch a, a fresh teaching. And so I'm... Uh, freshening this teaching up and doing an update on it uh, here to share with you today. And so I hope it blesses you and proves to you that God laid out the order of books um, perfectly in his divine inspiration, wisdom, and um, with his perfect engineered and architected design. Uh, a quick note also on the chapters and verses. Um, I've done further study on this and actually uh, all Stephen Langton did in 1205 AD was enumerate the already present thought and content divisions, which were already inherent within the text itself. So he, he didn't go in and just add chapter breaks randomly, like some people believe. He all, all he did was he enumerated. Basically, he counted them up. So he said, oh, this is chapter one. This So he put a one, a labeling where the beginning starts, and then where the already present thought and content division was, divinely inspired by God himself, uh, got enumerated with a number two and a number three and so on. And so um, there's some people that debate, oh, it's obvious that this should have been chapter five, should have started here, and chapter seven should have begun a little bit earlier. Some people debate about that, but for every uh, surface level reason they give to try to prove that uh, the division point should have been here instead of there, they never uh, debate that the division points are divinely inspired. There's sections. And for every reason that somebody can give to try to show why they think a particular division should be here instead of there, I can give a mystical and prophetic reason why it's exactly where God intended, intended it to be. And um, as, you, as you go through the studies that I've done on this subject, um, I think um, I give sufficient proof to that fact and um, even very compelling proof to that fact uh, to the point where it's just no longer a, an arguable position uh, unfortunately many people don't um, uh, aren't aware of it yet and that's why i'm sharing uh, these studies to to uh, get the word out more and share how god perfectly ordered and divinely inspired every aspect of his word including book order including chapter and verse designations um, it's perfectly designed. Uh, also, uh, another argument is E.W. Bullinger in the 1800s um, authored his commentary, which is found in the Companion Bible. And through it, one of the things that he discovered was the chiastic structure of the entire Bible and each book and each chapter within the Bible. So there's sections that are broken up, and those chiasms, those uh, chiastic structures within the Bible, perfectly conform to the chapter and verse breaks that we have. And so again, um, these are divinely inspired uh, structures within the Bible itself. And so I'm excited to share it with you and um, eager to jump right in. So let's get started. And so I have a, a visual representation uh, to help you with this. And it's going to manifest with a kind of a three-dimensional axis and then a fourth dimension time slice so you can see as as it progresses on um, into time God's plan you'll see that it's based on three dimensions and then I slice it up and keep progressing onward 
um, through each stage of progression represented by each book of the Bible. And so we're going to do the history section today. And so uh, what we start with is we're going to start with the um, first, we have this axis, which is the Z axis. And originally what I wanted to try to do was to kind of make the Z axis go into the vanishing point uh, at the center of the screen, kind of representing infinity or going on into eternity. Uh, but we were just working with PowerPoint where it was very difficult to try to represent uh, that with simple PowerPoint graphics. So I think as we go, you'll get the idea and you'll see that as we look on here, you'll see that the X axis here represents the world. And so this is the, we have Christ the creator who's before time and space. So that's why that's there in that position that it's in. And of course, with the book of Genesis, we have the Genesis of the world. We see that God creates the heaven and the earth. And we also see that um, within the book of Genesis, which is book one and stage one of this progression of this understanding, we have the Genesis of Israel, which begins in uh, the, the beginnings of that actually start uh, coming forth in Genesis chapter 12. And then how is this representative for us? Well, we each have our own personal Genesis. So each one of us has our own personal beginning as um, we come into the world. We have our own beginning in this unfortunately fallen world, which we inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve. And so as we look on here, um, we'll see that several things within this they match all three. So you can see that with Christ, the creator, he goes on this Z axis and he kind of walks the same progression, but where we fail, he succeeds. And he is not only the creator, he is also the champion of creation. And he is our savior who came to die on the cross for our sins to set us free uh, so that we could be reunited with him in right relationship. Uh, with him uh, to God the Father. And so uh, as we see this play out, we see that what is the, the overarching theme of the book of Genesis is God's perfect creation in the first two chapters are ruined by man's sin. And as we see that play out, we see that the ultimate result of that is in the last sentence in Genesis uh, chapter 50. Uh, the last verse of chapter 50 in Genesis reads, And he, that's referring to Joseph, was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. And so as that happens, we see that what does Genesis begin with? God's perfect creation. But because of man's sin, where does Genesis end? It ends in a coffin in Egypt with us dead in the world, uh, metaphorically speaking. And so because of man's sin, we end up dead in the world, but it's not death without hope because notice that he's embalmed. He's placed in the coffin in Egypt, but he's embalmed, which indicates there's an anticipation of a future resurrection. And so as we move forward to the next uh, stage of progression, it's going to be kind of like a walk. And so uh, I think my wife who helped me uh, put some of the graphics of this together. And so we kind of came up with this idea of walking through this, these stages of progression with represented there uh, by the footsteps. So as we step into this world um, personally, um, we also go through the same progression with our Genesis, with our beginning. And so as we move forward to the next step, this is like the time slice as I was talking about. Uh, so the next stage of progression is the Exodus stage. And so just like with Genesis ending dead in the world, with Joseph buried in a coffin in Egypt, uh, we likewise come into this world doomed to die because we're subject to mortal frame and the corruption of our flesh nature. So, um, but God wants to set us free from that. So just like he set the nation of Israel free as they, they come into Egypt and they, they end up in bondage in, to, to enslavement and death and decay in a fallen world and Egypt in scripture um, always represents the world in, sen in the sense of worldliness, in the sense of fallenness, in the sense of 
um, worldly um, lusts and worldly provision and um, idolatry and greed and lust and all the rest of it. Um, Egypt represents that uh, from a biblical perspective. So Israel, which represents God's people, um, is enslaved in bondage to death in Egypt. And so as we see that play out, um, what does God do for Israel? He brings them out with the exodus. Um, he's taking them out of this fallen world into an adventure of a new a spiritual based life. And so as we see that, um, we also have our own personal exodus as we continue this walk. So with the Israelites, God sent them a, a deliverer, a savior, uh, so to speak, Moses, who's a Christ type in that book. And so he comes to lead his people, Israel, out of bondage to death and decay in the world, out of enslavement of Egypt, into a new life based on faith. And so as we see that progression happen, um, Egypt resists the Exodus. Pharaoh, who represents Satan, he's a type or a model, a prefigure of Satan in that book. He doesn't want to let Israel go. And why is that? Well, it's obviously because um, Israel became Egypt's meal ticket because they were enslaved. They were the ones who were um, performing all the hard labor uh, to enrich the Egyptian empire and Pharaoh and and the royalty and the nobility of, of his kingdom. And so as uh, they're doing that, it's the same picture of what happened to man in the garden. What happens with the curse? Notice that the serpent is cursed and says, um, on your belly shall you go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. What is the curse on Adam? From dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so Adam is cursed with mortality, and the serpent is cursed with feeding on the dust, representing the mortality. So what does Satan feed on? His meal ticket is the mortality of man. He feeds on the dust of the earth. In other words, he feeds on our mortality. And so what did Pharaoh feed on? He fed on the enslavement of that bondage of Israel in the world. And so it's the same picture. And so uh, whenever somebody gets saved, it's like they become off limits. Their salvation is off limits because they're no longer in mortality. They're still, we're still uh, struggling with mortal frame, but our eternal destiny is um, secure and redeemed through our relationship with Christ. And so as Christ saves us out of a fallen world, it's a picture of how um, we come out of bondage to this world through Christ, just like Israel came out of bondage to Egypt through Moses. That's the picture. And so as, as we're walking this um, progression, sadly, most Christians stop right there. And that's they kind of uh, get that point pretty easily, Genesis and Exodus. But they don't understand that the rest of the Bible uh, is a continuation of that progression. So let's take a look at the next stage, uh, Leviticus. Sadly, most Christians, they start reading Leviticus, and they're just like, this doesn't make any sense to me, I'm going to put it down. It sounds weird, a bunch of sacrifices and a bunch of weird ritualistic rules and, and uh, all these things happening, and it doesn't, it doesn't register. Uh, however, if you get a good teacher to walk you through uh, the book of Leviticus, it's actually a beautiful picture of um, what basically I call God's standards. He um, exposes the wickedness of the standards of a fallen world uh, in Leviticus. And um, on this axis, which represents Israel, uh, Leviticus introduces a new set of standards for them to live by. Because God didn't send them out of Egypt to just go make their own nation so they could continue to live like they saw the Egyptians living. He wants them to live a new, um, empowered... Um, he wants them to live this um, amazing new spiritual faith-based life uh, based on his uh, standards, not the standards of a fallen world. And so sadly, many Christians, they get to the Exodus part, but then what do they do on the other side of the Red Sea, which is a picture of believer's baptism? They believed uh, and followed Moses across the Red Sea to be delivered from Pharaoh and his armies. And just like we uh, believe in Jesus, 
of the Messiah. We believe in him and he leads us out and we have believers baptism where once we're on the other side of that, it's like a picture of Satan not being able to touch us as regards in, as regarding our salvation. And so as we see that picture play out, we see that likewise, as we become Christians, we have new set of standards to live by. Now, obviously, it's not the ritualistic sacrificial system and the ceremonial laws and all that stuff. Um, but those first seven chapters of Leviticus that talk about all the five different sacrifices, like the burnt offering and the free will offering, the wave offering, and so on and so forth, all those offerings are various aspects of the one great sacrifice, the only true sacrifice made uh, by Jesus of himself on the cross. So if you get a good teacher, uh, you can go through Leviticus and you can see how um, God has orchestrated by prefigure all of these aspects of his perfect standards. His standards are not just higher standards, they're perfect standards. That And that is going to be the way that Israel was to live um, in fellowship and relationship with him and each other. It was only by the perfect sacrifice. And what is that a picture of? The perfect sacrifice, all those animal sacrifices and everything else they had to do. Uh, it was all a picture of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And so that was really the point of Leviticus. And sadly, what do most Christians want to do after they get on the other side of the Red Sea is they don't want to progress. They want to they want to be in their salvation. And on the other side of the Red Sea, they want to uh, build a McDonald's, build a Starbucks, build a Walmart, and build a bridge back to Egypt so they can go back anytime they want. And they can just kind of stay real close to Egypt and real close to worldly living um, and just think, okay, that's good enough. I got my salvation. And now I, I want to just park it right here and not make any progress um, anymore. And very sadly, that is why the church is anemic, is weak. Uh, that's one of the primary reasons why the church has gotten so corrupted um, in this day and age. And why a lot of corruption has entered the church is because too many people have that attitude. But God wants to lead them on, lead them forward into the promised land. He doesn't want them to just stop at the exodus stage of spiritual development. He wants them to move on. And so uh, with that said, um, we have a new set of standards to live by. The Holy Spirit comes inside of us once we receive salvation. And as that spirit is indwelling us, God reveals his new standards through his word saying, okay, the, the time for you to live lived like that is over. And now I want you to uh, start this process of sanctification. And so uh, it would be great if everybody just did that right away and we received sanctification and we obeyed his new standards and we started living that life perfectly from that point forward. Uh, in a sense, if we did that, then Leviticus could just be the last book of the Bible and everything would be great. But uh, God knows uh, how we are and he maintains his respect of our free will even after salvation. And that's what the book of Numbers is really all about. And so as we look at the book of Numbers, um, it's a picture of how the world resists spiritual growth. And so while they're in the wilderness time, they are uh, being weaned. This is kind of the weaning stage. That's what I call it, the weaning stage where they're now that they've been given the new set of standards in Leviticus. Right after they came out of Egypt, God had instructed them to construct a tabernacle and um, set up this tabernacle, this tent of meeting. And then he met Moses in the tent of meeting where uh, God delivers to Moses the entire book of Leviticus is given to him right there. So right after they come out of Egypt, um, very soon after they have all the instructions and God's perfect standards for righteous and holy living with him and with each other. And so they have it right away. But then as soon as that happens, you have the book of Numbers, which is where God says, okay, now we're going to, I'm going to start training you um, by these standards and I'm going to keep giving you more information and I'm going to keep um, giving you time to start adopting these new standards. And so the wilderness wandering is really a picture of how after we come to faith and we start understanding what God expects of us, um, he gently and slowly allows us to um, start adopting his standards, start learning how to walk by faith not by sight, 
uh, with the Nile, it was very um, easy to just, we have all the provision we need, we have all this water, we have all this, all these crops, we have all this luxury, um, we guaranteed have these seasons of, of, um, of productivity and prosperity, and um, we don't have to rely on the rains because where God was leading them in Israel, um, they really had to rely on his provision from heaven, uh, so to speak, by type with the rains, the early and the latter rains had to fall for everything to be prosperous in Israel, whereas the Nile was just a perpetual, um, never ending source of provision in Egypt. And so it's a kind of a picture of people who rely on the world uh, versus people who have to rely on God's provision. And so as we see that, um, the world resists spiritual growth and you see Israel is weaned onto uh, God's standards over the course of 40 years. Now, the real beauty, beautiful part about this is once they got on the other side of the Red Sea and they were given God's new standards for righteous and holy living, uh, it tells us in the, the next book, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, which we'll get to in a moment, it tells us that it was only an 11 day journey from where they were to where they, God was ultimately gonna lead them. And they could have adopted that. They could have said, okay, um, let's get from here to here in 11 days. But because of rebellion, because they grumbled against God, like most people do, um, despite all the miracles that he did to deliver them out of Egypt and save them from that horrible fate and the, the uh, um, just the awfulness of the uh, intimidation of the massive uh, equipped and fierce army of Pharaoh and his chariots, and his soldiers chasing after them and god provides this miracle after them it's only days later when they're on the other side and they start complaining well what in the world was the point of that we're on the other side where are we going to get water from where are we going to get food from you brought us out here to die uh grumble 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 complain 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 and really it's a picture of us because we do the exact same thing how many of us have begged and pleaded for god to deliver us and give us a miracle give us an answer to our prayers and then we receive it, and it's just hours later where we're already complaining about something else and asking for more. That's It's a picture. Remember that all things are written aforetime for our learning and our instruction. And just like when we uh, point the finger at Israel and say, how could they do that? There's three fingers uh, pointing back at us because really um, he's telling the story of us through the history of Israel. Uh, because we do the exact same thing. We have the exact same stubborn uh, nature and God is trying to get us to w get to work that out of us and uh, to adopt a more faithful faith-based um, style of living trusting in him to lead us and so what we see uh, moving forward is that we have to be weaned off of worldly standards too now uh, for each Christian this is different um, in some cases uh, some believers might take the 11 day plan uh, because that's possible if you want the 11 day plan and you want god to quickly get you moved on to the next stage um then he will and absolutely will do that and he and that is possible a lot of christians though it takes a while for um things to sink in and it takes a while of us spinning our wheels so to speak in the desert for us to get um trained to start leaving the world standards behind and start adopting his standards and and our wilderness wandering time is a picture of that and some christians uh takes months or years or decades even uh, some christians really do take the full 40 years some christians die in the wilderness sadly because they never live a victorious spiritual life and they only always live um a very complaining um spiritual life and they they think they're doing god a favor when they go to church uh once in a while and they have this this attitude of they receive salvation but they're going to keep complaining and keep expecting all kinds of things to be done for them and they never um even think of having god expect anything back from them and so that's really sad and what happened to all the firstborn who uh walked in the wilderness and came out of Egypt, what happens to them is that as they go on that progression, um, 
they all, except for Joshua and Caleb, die in the wilderness. And what is that a picture of? It's a picture of the firstborn nature who came out of Egypt dies in the wilderness wanderings, and only the secondborn nature, the born again, representing the born again nature, that is um, what is allowed to go on into victory. And so it's a picture for us that only God is only going to bless and equip and have spiritual victory for our born again nature. Our flesh nature, we can't take into victory. That's not going to be allowed. And so uh, as we move forward in this process, we see that um, God is not going to bless the, our, our flesh nature. He's only going to bless us as we submit to his guidance and leading uh, in our born again nature. That's what's going to be allowed to be blessed and to move forward into victory. And so before that can happen, um, uh, there's a stage of preparation. And this is Deuteronomy. It's what Deuteronomy is all about. Because while Israel is wandering in the wilderness and God is, is sanctifying them and weaning them off of the worldly ways and killing the firstborn nature, so to speak, in the desert, helping uh, people. For the Christian, this is a picture of us crucifying the flesh with its passions and putting the to death the members of our earthly body, uh, which are basically idolatry, and that's in Colossians 3, 5. And um, adopting this, this uh, idea of our born-again nature and letting God lead us in that and developing us in that to bless us in that way. And so this is the fifth stage, the fifth book, Deuteronomy. And so um, what we see as God is leading them in the wilderness, what is Satan doing? He is populating the land of Canaan, the promised land, with all kinds of giants and, and fierce um, enemies to God's people. And he's creating on the way there. There's a bunch of enemies. They they go through Edom. They go through uh, Moab. They're going uh, through all these places. And then eventually they come to where they're going to cross. And you have Sihon and Og, these Nephilim uh, kings there that are fiercely opposing them. Because um, the world, represented by Egypt and then all the surrounding nations around the Promised Land, uh, Satan is using those fleshly based nations to resist Israel's progress. And so the challenges get harder and harder as they get closer and closer and closer to the promised land. And the same is true for the, the Christian. As we get weaned off of worldly ways and get prepared for spiritual battle, um, that's what happens in Deuteronomy. Basically, Moses gives a series of sermons and he reminds them of all that God had done for them, miraculously leading them out of Egypt and leading them on this journey and sustaining them and supporting them and providing for them throughout the entire process. And then how he's trained them to be looking for living by faith and living by his miraculous provision instead of living by the world's standards. And so we as Christians also need to be prepared. How do we do that? Well, you're doing it right now. You're getting spiritual instruction through Bible teaching. Um, Bible study, through prayer, through fellowship, through um, giving, through almsgiving, through um, sanctification and holiness, uh, fasting, all the Christian disciplines that you can read about in the New Testament and that you hear sermons on Sunday sermons, Sunday teachings, Bible study teachings, uh, Wednesday night fellowship or Monday, Tuesday Bible study, um, choir practice or whatever it is that you might do as a dedication of and sanctification process for your life and whatever the Lord might lead you to do. These are all the things that you do. They're reminders. We're constantly being reminded of all God has done for us and constantly being reminded of all his future promises to us. That's what the book of Deuteronomy is all about. And it helps get us ready for those spiritual battles that we face um, as we go forward into um, the, the higher levels of Christianity. So you can see that this time slice book by book it's a progression of a christian's life and so most people they can get up to that far they they at least get to exodus and understand that but i hope that i've helped you to see that this is laid out in a divine order okay so um if i had more screen space here i would just do the whole progression there's 17 stages of progression uh, and i would do the whole one on one screen but since we're out of space here I'm going to have to go to a new slide, but we're just going to, we're going to 
um, just imagine that this just carries forward. And so as we go on to the next stage, I'm going to go to a new slide, but this whole uh, process just continues and picks up from where we left off. So now we're in stage six, where worldly giants oppose Joshua, Yeshua. Um, that's a type. He's a type of Christ, just like Moses was a type of Christ fulfilling the law. Joshua is a type of Christ leading people on into spiritual victory uh, from that point of the uh, fulfillment of the law through his earthly ministry and his sacrifice of himself on the cross. Okay, so uh, we recall that only Joshua and Caleb were the ones who were able to cross the Jordan. All the other Israelites died in the desert. The firstborn died in the desert and only their children represent, their children in this analogy, represent the born again uh, nature, which is blessed and allowed to move on and move forward into the um, promised land, which is a picture for this Christian of the spiritually victorious life. Okay, some people think it's a picture of going to heaven, but that's not true. It's a picture of, because in heaven do you have a uh, evil, wicked Nephilim giants that are waiting to try to uh, destroy you uh, when you get to heaven? No. So this is a picture of um, victorious spiritual life, and as they say, as the phrase goes, higher levels, bigger devils, and that's what they see when they're getting ready to come into the promised land. They have some serious battles to do, and everything up to that point has been preparing them for those battles. And so what does uh, Joshua do? He Joshua leads Israel in, I say spiritual victory here, but it, it's also a picture of, in the natural, they have natural victory over those giants, but it's a picture of the spiritual victory that we have in Christ and crossing the Jordan is a picture of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, this is to equip you to go and conquer things that used to dominate and intimidate you. And so uh, recall that in Acts chapter two, once they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were running like scared children before that event. They were hiding and, and um, uh, hiding away after the uh, crucifixion of Christ. And now, after being baptized in the Holy Spirit, Peter's out boldly preaching in the streets of Jerusalem the gospel to all the people who had just um, been guilty of supporting the crucifixion of Jesus, yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And so now he's boldly out in the streets of Jerusalem preaching the gospel without fear. And that's the point of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, because he will equip you to have the ministry tools and the faith and the anointings and the gifts of the Spirit uh, to be able to accomplish the ministry that he's called uh, each believer into. And sadly, most Christians today, they never get baptized in the Holy Spirit. They never uh, ask him to. They don't even know what it is. And um, sadly, a lot of churches teach that, oh, being baptized in water is that's when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit too, and that's not true. Uh, for some people, that's the way it works. They get baptized in the Holy Spirit right away. Uh, some people even get baptized in the Holy Spirit before they undergo water baptism. We see that happen in the book of Acts also. Uh, but a lot of people, they come to faith, they kind of start their, their faith journey, and then they sit there in the wilderness wanderings time uh, of their life, and they never make this progression. They never have spiritual victory in their life because they just keep living um, fleshly lives um, and they don't ever taste that spiritual victory. But Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. Jesus gives us spiritual victory over the giants that used to intimidate and dominate us. What is that a picture of? Well, what about the giant of alcoholism? People are looking at it like it's a towering giant that they will never conquer and they look like a grasshopper in its sight. Well, once you get baptized in the Holy Spirit and God equips and empowers you and delivers you from that bondage, and he allows you to now look at alcoholism like it's a grasshopper in your sight. Because if you ask him to, and you are sincere, and you really want victory over that, God will give you victory over it. He wants to give you victory. Now, deliverance and spiritual empowerment does not replace discipline. You still have to be disciplined. You still have to, you still have to say no. Uh, but he will give you the ability to say no through the empowerment of his Holy Spirit. And so as you see that, it, this is a picture 
of the progression of a believer's life. And it's awesome. And we have that power. And so uh, a lot of people, they keep wanting to pamper the flesh. They want to indulge the flesh and they don't want that power. That's why they're still stuck in bondage. Not because God doesn't want to give it to them, but because they don't want it. Because they still want to stay stuck in that carnal Christian, uh, baby Christian mindset. And sadly, that leaves a lot of people into backsliding. And I've even seen it lead, pe lead people uh, to abandon the faith completely. And it's a very, very sad thing to see, but it's true. It happens. And so um, this is kind of the progression. And as you see it go, go forth, uh, the next stage is the book of Judges. And what happens in Judges is a picture of the world through Satan preys on Israel when complacency and moral relativism sets in. Remember in the book of Judges, um, Joshua dies, and it's kind of a picture of Jesus, uh, you know, when he died and got crucified, and then he, he ascends back to the Father. It's a picture of he leaves them off to go back, and uh, he leaves them off to go back and to um, be um, taken, um, into a new levels of victory in their spiritual walk. He wants them to take more territory. Uh, they had conquered, you know, they marched in and they had victory and they went in and they did this and they did that and they uh, conquered this people and they conquered that people. And, um, you know, the Canaanites were, were spread, were uh, scattered and the Nephilim were, were destroyed and the Rephaim were destroyed, uh, you know, the, the other name for the Nephilim. And he, they go in and they march through and they, they take victory. But after Joshua dies, um, he leaves this unction for them to continue on. They're supposed to continue on and, and continuing to conquer more territory and to continue wiping out the pockets of uh, the Canaanites and the Rephaim and all those uh, um, corrupt races uh, that were there from the fallen angels intermingling with human women. And they were supposed to go and take more territory. But instead, what did they do? They got complacent, and it happens, and it's very common, and the complacency comes in, and it just says, um, you know, oh, this is good enough, we've taken enough, and we've had enough victory, let's just uh, kick our feet up and rest on our laurels, like the laurel wreaths of the old Olympians with the, the leaves, leaf crowns that they would get, um, and those uh, resting on your laurels, um, that's what Israel did, and then what happens? The enemies the Midianites, the Edomites, the um, Amalekites, and all these groups, they start resurging and reforming, and God allows them to do that because he's not pleased with Israel. He's, he's seeing them fall back into fleshly patterns, and even those who've tasted spiritual victory and been baptized in the Holy Spirit, this can happen to them, and it frequently does happen because people say, oh, I've had spiritual victory. I conquered this in my life. I've conquered that in my life. Uh, God has given me empowerment. He's allowed me to uh, to um, have these victories, and now I'm a leader, I'm a Bible study teacher, I'm an evangelist, I'm winning people to the Lord, I've done this, I've done that. Um, God has made me the worship leader, and look how great all the things he's done for me are. And then you kind of start just kind of leveling out, and you just start kind of uh, not increasing, and you just start kind of uh, stagnating, and then what happens the enemy starts encroaching back in um, because you're not growing. And so if that happens, um, which can and does happen most frequently in this seventh stage, and Israel struggled to maintain their spiritual victory or their, their victory over the promised land, and for us that's a picture of our spiritual victory, and we struggle to maintain our spiritual victory and not be overcome by complacency. And so um, as you see that uh, transpiring here, uh, that same concept happens to us. And so we got to watch out for that. We got to be careful of that. Um, and then the next stage is, and this, this whole progress happened to Israel, and it happens to each believer individual individually in some measure. Uh, this, this progress is kind of uh, the progression that Christians um, who continue to seek the Lord and continue to uh, be developed and and uh, discipled and uh, continue to be um, equipped and empowered and uh, continue to be sanctified and 
um, in higher and higher levels of spiritual devotion to him. This progress, this, this happens for all believers. Okay, but it also happened for the church in general. So the church has gone through this whole progress. The church, after Acts, they boldly um, receive the deliverance. And it's like a picture of all the believers coming out of Egypt, so to speak. Uh, come, but in their case, it was Rome. They came out of the fear of Rome and the Roman occupation and the religious uh, establishment and all the things that were corrupt. They came out of that and the church began. And they had this massive... Uh, um, conversion experience and thousands and thousands and thousands of people get saved. The gospel is going out to the ends of the earth during the, the stage of the book of Acts. And then um, what happens is they start sanctifying and they get whole, you know, they go through this holiness and sanctification process. They're, they're giving uh, to the church and the apostles. They're laying all this, uh, all these offerings at the apostles feet and the church is growing in leaps and bounds and they're forming this new organization. Everything's great. Uh, they're being sanctified, they're adopting God's standards, they're being filled with his Holy Spirit, they're being powered with, uh, like, the stage of, of uh, they're being prepared to go out and get the gospel out to the very, very outer reaches of the earth, and then they're they're going and doing it, and they have all these leaders, and, and Paul, and Peter, and John, and everybody else, they're all going out and uh, having this great victory, and then um, after they kind of get established, they're maintaining this victory, and then the church enters the judges stage where they kind of get to a point where the church conquered the world. The church got all the way to Rome and got established in Rome. And then eventually it becomes the state religion. And it's kind of like they got to that point. And ever since that point, the church has been in the judges stage of the corporate church development process. Because as soon as the church took over the world and the the state became officially quote unquote Christian, then you started having non regenerated people in the church and non regenerated people in leadership in the church. And then people started thinking, oh, well, we this is good enough. Um, we'll kind of just establish some church, church things, and we'll have churchianity instead of Christianity. We'll have people who are Christianized instead of Christian. We'll have people who are churchgoers instead of the church. We'll have people who know about God, but they don't know God. And all of those things started happening. And then that's the same thing that happened with Israel in the book of Judges. And the book of Judges spans a long period of time, um, roughly 400 years or so, just like the church has been through uh, now 40 jubilees. And it, it is interesting because uh, that comes up often in the book of Judges, where it's like 40 years they do well, then they start falling away. And God is displeased with them, so he lets their enemies encroach back in on them. And what happens? They have to repent, they have to uh, seek God, and then he sends them a deliverer. And he brings a revival. And what has happened through the whole time of the history of the church? Uh, since Rome and the state and the church kind of married each other, you've had uh, times when God had to bring revival back into the church. And he brought a deliverer. And he brought somebody to bring some uh, a move of the spirit back into the church. And the church has gone through ebbs and flows of kind of getting complacent and getting religious. And then God brings a move of the spirit and gets things going again. And that's a perfect picture of the stage of Judges. And what happens in Judges? Some horrible things. There's horrible, horrible things that are done by Israelites during the time of the Judges. Uh, very wicked things. And what's happened in the church? Well through, for instance, the Roman Catholic Church and others, there's been some horrible things that have happened in the name of the church and in the name of Christ that were never um, endorsed by God or Christ at all. Yet, nevertheless, some horrible things got done in the name of Christ or in the name of Christianity or in the name of church, but they used the name of Christ in vain because God never called them to do any of those things. And so uh, a lot of people, there was a lot of blood on the church's hand, just like there was a lot of blood on Israel's hand during the stage of the judges. It's the exact same picture. And so we go through the exact same process as they did. And then what happens at the very end of the stage of judges? Well, Ruth, who is a Moabitess, during the ending stages of the judges' time period, you have Ruth 
who is a picture or type of a Gentile bride, marries, she leaves her home country, which is Moab, which is the worst of the worst of the Gentile nations. In the word of God, God calls Moab two times, two times in scripture. He calls Moab his wash pot. He calls them his um, toilet, essentially. That's what that means. So uh, it, God says himself, he says, Moab is my wash pot. And it's a picture of um, God basically calling that country his toilet. That's what it means. That was the ancient name for toilet was wash pot. And then also God says in his word that no Moabite shall come into his assembly uh, forever. In other words, no Moabite is allowed into the temple, is allowed into the sanctuary. No, no Moabite can come into the, the commonwealth of Israel forever, for all time, uh, because he's so displeased with that the horrible uh, paganism and the child sacrifice and all the wicked things that the children of Moab were doing. And so how can Ruth be a Moabitess who comes into Israel and enters into the commonwealth of Israel? How can that happen? Well, if you look at Ruth chapter 1, you'll see that she's a Moabitess, and she's she's a Gentile from the worst of the Gentiles, the worst Gentile nation that God identifies in all of Scripture. So the worst of the worst, the most depraved. But what happens is, you'll see it in Ruth chapter 1, she says, I don't want to be a Moabite anymore. She tells Naomi, her mother-in-law, I want, your God will be my God, your people, my people. I'm going to worship the one true living God, your God, and who is that? Essentially, that's Jesus. So when she puts her faith and trust in Christ by type, in God, the God of the universe, God made flesh, Jesus Christ, she is now not, she's no longer a Moabitess, she's a believer. And so as she's a believer, yes, she is now eligible, she's converted. And so now she is eligible to come into Israel, and she's got a Gentile background, but she believes in, essentially, God. She believes in Christ and God the Father, and she believes in the fact that God the Father is going to send um, his Messiah, and she learns Israel's ways, and she follows Israel's ways, and she follows the belief, uh, the beliefs of the faithful Israel at the time. And what happens? Well, Ruth brings Naomi, uh, she comes with Naomi, and Naomi, who represents Israel in this typology, she comes back into the land at the end of the season of the judges' time, towards the end of that age, and she comes into the land with Ruth, and Ruth is a Gentile bride who marries a Jewish kinsman redeemer, Boaz, and he's a Judean. He's from the tribe of Judah, and his name means strength, and... He is a type of Christ, and he is a kinsman redeemer that can redeem the inheritance of Naomi's uh, husband, who died, and his sons, who also died in a Gentile world. And they all died and perished, yet Boaz is going to redeem their inheritance through Ruth. It's a picture of a Gentile bride marrying a Jewish kinsman redeemer, a Judean, Jesus, he's the lion from the tribe of Judah, and as a, he marries a Gentile bride at the time when uh, Israel comes back into the land, right before the end times of the harvest season is upon them. And so you see, where is Ruth? Right before the threshing happens, at the very last times before the harvest, she's gleaning in the fields of Boaz. In other words, she's participating in the harvest, meaning from a typology perspective she's like a christian going out and gleaning in the harvest getting people saved uh the last few people getting getting them saved by sharing the good news uh with them right before the rapture of the church and so uh we have a little graphic an animation graphic here uh for this stage and so the feet remember this walk has been happening uh from stages one through eight and what happens at this stage well it's a picture of the rapture of the church and the church leaving the world through Israel. So we get raptured up out of the picture 
right before uh, the threshing of the judgment happens at, during the, the final stage of, of human history on earth before the tribulation period. And so um, as we see that happen and that transpire, uh, you see that how that beautiful picture emerges and what happens next in the Bible is that the kingdom age begins, the age of the judges ends and the kingdom age commences. And so we see this with the next set of slides. And so as uh, this transpires, we're going to be looking at um, 1 Samuel, which is the ninth book. Nine, eight is always representing Christ because it's a number, even the symbol of the number you say about, you know, making a figure eight, um, it's a symbol of eternity, it's a symbol of infinity. So 888 is actually the geometrical value of Jesus Christ in the Greek, in the New Testament. His number is, the number of his name is 888. Um, just like the number of the Antichrist is 666, representing fallen men. Uh, six represents men. Uh, one of, that's one of the things the number six represents. It represents man and his mortality. And so 666 is like an ultimate, 888 is like an ultimate infinity or eternity uh, through Christ. And 666 is like ultimate mortality uh, of man, kind of like um, you see with the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast. And so um, 9 is always a representative of judgment. And so as you see 9 being judgment, well, what's the ninth book of the Bible? 1 Samuel. And this is a typology um, of the tribulation period. Because what happens uh, during this time, well, remember that the x-axis represents the world going in the, going off the edge, if you will. That's kind of why I did that. It's kind of like going off the edge into the fires of the uh, lake of fire of judgment and eternal damnation. And so this x-axis kind of represents the world, and that's why the y-axis represents, you know, this vertical uh, going up to God. And so as we see this, um, unfortunately, since Israel rejected their Messiah, we see that at the end times, Israel is going to join the world in clamoring after a king, a king who looks and seems really good at first, someone who is head and shoulders above the rest. Who was King Saul? He was very tall, dark, and handsome, as they say. And he looked good. He was tall. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. Everybody was looking to him. He seemed really good at first. He seemed kind and gentle, like a man of peace. And, and everybody was thinking that he's going to be our champion. He's going to be the one that uh, leads us into the next um, stage of, of kingdom uh, living. And it's going to be wonderful. We want a king like everybody else. Let's have this great king. And he's going to rule over Israel and make Israel this overarching nation over the Gentile nations and, and bring in the kingdom glory. And what is the Antichrist going to be? The exact same thing. This is a typology or a picture of Antichrist. And as you see this going forth, again, stage nine, um, well, you have true Israel represented here, uh, not faithless Israel who has rejected their Messiah. But true Israel is going to be on earth here on the vertical axis. The 144,000 plus the two witnesses, of course, are going to have the baton passed to them from the church. And they're going to become the new evangelists and the new ministers um, of the gospel to the world during the tribulation time. And so at this point, uh, the x-axis representing Christ as our champion and us as we follow and are in relationship with him, while we, the church, are in heaven preparing for his imminent return, we come back with him after this time. And notice what's interesting in Samuel is that um, David is kind of behind the scenes here, just like in 1 Samuel. Um, Saul is the king, representing, uh, typologically speaking, representing the Antichrist. And David is kind of more famous than Saul. And that really grinds his gears, that really just gets him... Because people are saying, oh, David has slain his ten thousands and Saul his thousands. Uh, David is the one who's the champion of Israel. He's the one who leads her armies in and out. Um, Saul, he's the king, but eh, you know, he's not that great. And it's going to be the same way in the tribulation. The Antichrist is going to be the one who wants the attention. He wants the glory. He wants 
um, acknowledgement as being the great guy who's going to lead the world out of its troubles, and he's going to lead Israel to rebuilding their temple and doing all the great things that he promises and bringing in peace, but it's a false peace, and internally he's corrupt just like Saul was. Saul seemed good at first, but he can't obey anything. Uh, Samuel tells him what the prophecies are, tells him what to do, and then he disobeys. Saul, uh, Samuel tells him again this, and then he disobeys again. He can't keep, because uh, he's internally corrupt, he can't obey God. Just like the Antichrist is going to seem good on the outside uh, to a lot of people, but internally he's going to be completely wicked and corrupt. And what does Saul end up doing? He ends up trying to kill and murder David multiple times, and he also tries to kill and murder uh, David's followers. So it's a picture of the believers in Christ. Um, he wants to kill them, this king who seemed like a good idea, but he really wants to kill the true king, Christ, and he wants to kill his followers and people. Uh, David's followers and people are a type of believers in that time, the tribulation saints, uh, and the true Israelites. He's going to want to kill them um, and take all the glory for and attention to himself, even though he's internally corrupt. And so that's a perfect picture. First Samuel is a perfect picture of the tribulation time. And so as we see this carry forward, we see that 2 Samuel is a picture or a type of the second coming. And so what happens here, Jesus Christ returns with the church to begin setting up his kingdom on earth. And so now um, we start getting into a stage where the world starts getting reconciled with the domain of heaven because Jesus is now on the scene in glory with his church in resurrected bodies. So now this x-axis is going to start representing, uh, because of the judgment of the tribulation has already come and gone, the x-axis is also going to start representing uh, the fact that uh, God and his people are starting to take over uh, the trajectory of the world and God's ultimate fulfillment and purposes for it. And so uh, the y-axis is still operative here as well because Jesus Christ again returns to set up his kingdom in Israel. And so um, these two are now after the judgment of stage 9, um, the testimony of stage 10, which is 10 is the number of testimony, and that's one of the things the number 10 represents, and it uh, they start to converge. So you're going to start to see the x-axis and the y-axis and the z-axis start to converge at this point uh, because God is going to be... Um, reconciling all things to him through Christ, even the world, even the fallen world, and the world is going to be redeemed and restored itself. And so, of course, where are we at this point? Well, the church returns with Christ, and so we have the animation back. Notice that the feet uh, weren't there in this, in because our walk, as part of the church, we don't walk through the tribulation because the rapture happens first, then the tribulation happens, and our walk resumes from heaven because we come back with Christ at this stage. And so as we move forward from here, uh, we see 1 Kings. Now, this is interesting because a lot of people believe that when Jesus sets foot again on the Mount of Olives, that the Millennial Kingdom starts at that moment. And I understand that viewpoint, and it kind of sounds like it. that's what it does And if you read Revelation 20. But if you read some other passages and make a few inferences, as well as just use some basic logic, um, it doesn't it doesn't follow. Um, it doesn't make any sense because what has to happen um, when Christ comes back, well, you have the sheep and the goat judgments. Those who supported the tribulation saints and the believers and Israel, the true Israel, um, those who, who start believing in Jesus as their Messiah, as soon as you start seeing that, all those who support them and hide them away and protect them from the Antichrist and those who band together in opposition of the Antichrist and uh, those who try to help them, um, kind of like those who helped uh, is uh, who helped the Jews during the Holocaust. Um, those people and those nations who try to help uh, during that time are going to be blessed at the sheep and the goat judgments, and the goat nations who uh, helped persecute the Jews and the tribulation saints during that time are going to be judged at the sheep and the goat judgments. Okay, so with that said. Um, the stage of setting up the kingdom, I believe, is going to take some time because the millennial temple has to be rebuilt. And I don't think Jesus is just going to wave a magic wand and all the destruction and the terror of 
nuclear war, which is inferred from Ezekiel 38 and 39, all the terror and destruction of the Battle of Armageddon and 200 million plus um, corpses uh, who were dead in the Valley of Jezreel at the, after the Battle of Armageddon, that all has to be cleaned up. All the war and the devastation and the destruction from the plagues and the war and the pestilence and so on and so forth. Um, the world is going to be in ruins. And uh, Jesus has never been one to just wave a magic wand and do things the easy way and make everything um, happy again. No, I believe the time of setting up the kingdom is going to take time. Uh, we see from Ezekiel chapter 40 that a measuring line has to be set up. The temple has to be built. Um, the church is going to be ruling and reigning with Christ over all the world. So the church is going to be going and, and uh, there's going to be there's going to need to be uh, somebody ruling and reigning over America. So somebody's going to rule and reign over America. Um, I don't know if it'll still be called that in that time. Who knows? Uh, but somebody's going to be ruling over Europe. Somebody's going to be ruling over Africa. Somebody's going to be ruling over Japan and China and so on and so forth. Australia, New Zealand, and all the provinces. Somebody's going to be the quote-unquote president of the United States. Somebody's going to be the prime minister of Japan. Somebody's got to be the governor of Texas. Somebody's going to be the governor of California. And praise God, it won't be Gavin Newsom. And somebody's going to be doing the mayorships and Somebody's going to be in charge of the organizations, and people are going to be in charge of uh, this, that, and the other. Um, you know, because why? Because there's still people living in the flesh, and they still need to be governed, and they still need to be uh, there. Still need to be oversight, and there still needs to be um, hierarchy. And just like it says in the parable of the talents and the minas, and God says, you know. Um, You've been faithful in much, so you're going to enter into um, the joy of your master, and you're going to be ruling over uh, ten cities. Some people are going to be ruling over five cities, and some people are going to be, you know, somebody's going to be um, the superintendent of this school district. Somebody's going to be the principals of the schools. Somebody's going to be the um, chief of police, and so on and so forth. Notice how I'm mentioning all these leadership roles, right? Because who are in the leadership roles now? Well, sadly... By and large, across the world, mostly it's corrupt people, the devil's people. The children of wrath are mostly in charge now. Um, not always, but by and large, for the most part, um, the devil's people are are the rulers and the senators and the um, superintendents and the um, CEOs and the uh, clearly the, the leaders of the media are going to be um, are right now the devil's people by and large and who is it going to be during the millennial reign well it's going to be us uh, various people who've served uh, well in the church and they've proven that they were faithful in little they're going to be now faithful in much because we're going to be ruling and reigning uh, with Christ as he's seated in Jerusalem with King David as a prince ruling under him uh, in Israel as per Ezekiel 37 uh, likewise, the church is going to be ruling and reigning over all the what were formerly the Gentile nations of the world. And so um, that's, I believe, how it's going to work. And so that doesn't just, you know, a blink of an eye and all of a sudden that happens. Just like the church started in 32 AD, but there was a transition period where the church age and the age of the temple in, in Jerusalem, these two kind of intersected and there was a transition period. Where the temple still existed until 70 AD, the Sanhedrin actually existed until 75 AD, and so the church began in 32 AD, but the church didn't fully take over as God's, um, the church didn't completely take over um, the leadership of the, of the next age until the 70s AD. And so the church, the church began in 32 AD, but the church age really didn't begin until after 70 AD. And so if you think about it like that, uh, you can see that, likewise, there's this age of overlap where I believe, you know, the, the church age after the tribulation and the remnants of it are going to overlap the kingdom age. And there's going to be a time of everybody in all the nations of the world needing to reorient themselves to the new plan, a new age, the kingdom age, just like everybody had to reorient to the church taking over 
uh, from the temple age, uh, uh, during the, the, the age of the law, uh, where God worked through Israel, through the temple. And so, just the same way, there's going to be a transition time, I believe. Maybe it'll be 40 years again. Um, so if the rapture happens this year, or next year, or 2025, uh, the tribulation goes by, and then um, just like the church age started in 70 AD, or some say 75 AD, the uh, kingdom age, maybe it'll start in 2075 AD. When the, I mean the kingdom age, the kingdom age will actually start in 2075 AD as the Zadok calendar and the um, Essene calendar, and as the Essenes prophesied and believed that to be the case, uh, based on the excellent work by uh, Dr. Ken Johnson on his channel, BibleFacts.org, and his uh, YouTube channel and all his other channels, has, uh, has, has exquisitely described and explained. Uh, so if that uh, belief and theory is correct, um, the rapture could be very, very, very soon, very, very soon, and you could see things overlapping where uh, after the rapture, the seven-year tribulation, and Jesus' return, you could have a transition time where the millennial temple gets built, the world gets restored and renewed, everything, every, all the church administration over the world gets delegated and set up, and um, all the people from the church get set up into their roles of the millennium and we're going to be ruling and reigning over the people who survived the tribulation in the flesh and those who repopulate the world uh, during the millennial kingdom during the millennial reign we are going to be ruling and reigning over it okay so we're going to be the presidents prime ministers superintendents ceos principals um and so police chiefs and so on mayors and governors and so on and so forth that's going to be us, uh, the church. And so, uh, and it'll be in proportion and according to what you did for the Lord and your faithfulness um, to be uh, in this age, uh, what your role will be in that kingdom age, I personally believe. Okay, so how does this fit with First Kings? Well, notice that Solomon takes over for David, and so kind of David is a picture of the second coming where Christ gets comes back, uh, builds the millennial temple, and gets everything set up for the kingdom age to commence. And then Solomon represents the glorified kingdom because that's when the kingdom of Israel really got glorified and that's when everything really took off and the wealth and the prosperity and all the nations of the world looked to Solomon and all the leaders of the world looked to Solomon for his wisdom and his might and everything and all his glory and all the prosperity and everything that happened happened during Solomon's reign. And so he's a type of Christ in the millennial kingdom during that age. Now, some people don't like that because of Solomon falling uh, in 1 Kings chapter 11, so they don't like that analogy. But it is true. It is true. People don't have a problem with David being used as a type of Christ uh, with the Psalms and with everything that he does to, to take uh, the, the kingship over, um, over uh, Jerusalem and consolidating and federating Israel's confederation of tribes under a kingdom. They don't have a problem with using David as a Christ type, despite what happens to David in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. So why do you have a problem with, with Solomon uh, being used as a type of Christ in the beginning of 1 Kings, just because of what happens to him later? Um, so think about that. It's a picture. Uh, some of the things that happen are, you know, we have to look at it in the natural, but then also look at it in the spiritual. You have to see the two different levels, the natural and the spiritual. So yeah, Solomon had 700 concubines and 300, I mean 700 wives and 300 concubines. Well, what does that equal? It's a thousand. There's a thousand. Uh, remember, there's a thousand year millennial reign. Uh, remember that there's seven churches amplified. It's kind of like there's 7,000 um, or 700, sorry. And there's tribulation saints, kind of like 300. There's like 300. So if you think about the 700 wives being like um, 700 rulers or leaders um, of the church over the world during the millennial reign, and the 300 concubines being like 300 tribulation um, saints ruling and reigning, uh, you could see the typology. Now, does that justify what Solomon did in that? No. In the natural, that doesn't justify what he did, but you can see that you can elevate that and look at it from a spiritual perspective. Okay, so... It, 
think about it like that. Think about like David, King David. Um, well, he had seven wives, right? Like the seven churches. And then he, he has an eighth, an eighth wife. Uh, but his eighth wife, it's kind of a, it's a bad story. Because who's his eighth wife? Well, it's Bathsheba. So in the natural, it is obviously David's sin and it's his shame and uh, the whole world. It's been publicized to the whole world. Uh, but look at the spiritual aspect of it. Because it's like David has his seven wives with him in the natural while he's ruling and reigning in Hebron, minus Michal, but he's ruling and reigning in Hebron, married to seven wives, right? Um, and then there's one who's married to somebody else who's a Hittite, like somebody from the world, right? Uriah the Hittite. And then she becomes married to David um, because of his adultery and, and her adultery. Uh, so that's in the natural, that's bad, but look at it from the elevated spiritual perspective. Uh, does Christ gain another devoted um, bride, if you will, um, a wife, if you will, during the tribulation? Well, yes, during the tribulation saints, those who were married to the world. Okay, so looking at it from a spiritual perspective, those who are married to the world, um, who weren't ready for the rapture, who get left behind, well, they become tribulation saints, and they are martyred for him um, in the spiritual perspective of it. So it's kind of like Christ has uh, the church, seven brides, but he also has other followers besides that in the uh, tribulation time in the spiritual aspect of it. So you can look at Bathsheba as kind of like an eighth wife, just like the tribulation saints become kind of like an eighth member of um, his followers and believers, not the church. It's a different, uh, different people, different um, eternal role and eternal destiny. Yet, just like with Solomon, he has uh, in the natural 700 wives and 300 con concubines. But in the spiritual uh, aspect of it, you could you could typologically see that as being uh, like 700 chief um, rulers reigning over the various countries and provinces and, and uh, aspects of the millennial reign and 300 concubines maybe representing the tribulation saints who are also a part of that ruling and reigning uh, we know that from revelation 20 right and so as we as we see that uh take place and we see that uh transpire um you know don't be uh don't be um uh shy of that remember that it does not justify what david did with Bashi, but it does not justify what solomon did but god uses their natural sins uh, remember, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So God even works in the bad things that people did um, as types or models of him and his role in the ultimate destiny of it. He works those in in a way that still has um, a, some sort of good uh, ultimate end result because he works it out for good and he paid for all of it on the cross anyway. So uh, think about if you could think about it like that, that might help you. It's a conjecture, so I don't want to oversell it, but you might think about it in that way. Okay, so um, Jesus, um, he is ruling, rules and glory from Jerusalem, Israel, and the glorified kingdom reign once Christ's rule and authority is fully realized. That's what First Kings is a picture of. And people think, well, how can that be? Because after Solomon kind of falls away, um, First Kings gets pretty ugly. Well... What's going to happen in the ultimate um, implementation of this? What happens with it? Well, as the church rules and reigns with Christ in glory, as you see that happening, what happened during Solomon's reign is the flesh was still present. Notice that even in Solomon, Solomon was still in the flesh, despite all of his wisdom and all of his majesty and all the glory, uh, glorified kingdom that God provided. Uh, despite all of that, uh, notice that um, Solomon um, is still in the flesh. So what's going to happen during the millennial reign of Christ? Well, Christ um, will be in his resurrected body, obviously, and we will be in our resurrected bodies. And so we will not be in the flesh in that sense anymore. However, those who survive the tribulation and repopulate the earth will still be in the flesh. And so because the flesh is still present during the millennium, it won't be a perfect kingdom. Uh, the flesh will be subdued. 
the church will hold sway god's spirit will hold sway over the world and the spirit of christ and his presence ruling and reigning over the world will hold sway and so a rebellion will be tamped down the flesh will be tamped down everything will be under control um prayer and communication with christ and the church will prevail and everything will be um you know sin will be very 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 minimized isaiah 65 gets gives us a hint of this and it says that um you know the the person who dies at 100 years old it'll be like they're a curse that'll be like a child dying uh, why because things will be very quick to be dealt with uh sin won't be allowed and people will be governed by um a very uh very shepherding you know the church will be shepherding over the whole world and all those that are in the flesh but the flesh will never really have been tested and the tempter satan will not be present because he will be imprisoned for a thousand years during this time and the people um won't have satan throttling their their sin nature and so they will never have really been tested but what's happening as more and more and more people get born in the flesh during the millennium well just like what happens in first kings what happens when even solomon himself uh is in the flesh at that point and he falls away and then the you know the civil war breaks out and and things start to fracture and things start to get uh from the faithful versus those who are unfaithful it's going to be it's a picture of those who are ruling and reigning in righteousness as the church under christ and the tribulation saints who are also ruling and reigning during that time and then what's the picture of that is like those who are born in the flesh there's going to be more and more and more and more and more flesh as the earth gets repopulated under uh, the millennial reign through those who survive the tribulation and so as that happens um the earth is going to be ripe for rebellion and a, a final temptation and a final uh, fleshly rebellion after Satan gets released from his prison at the end of the thousand years. And so when that happens, it'll be a picture, a perfect picture of First Kings, because what happens, um, you see that at the end of First Kings, there is Second Kings, which is a picture of uh, that fractured nature of a final deterioration and rebellion will mount at the end of the millennial reign and we see that detailed in revelation chapter 20 it talks about it how satan is released from his prison and he and his minions are allowed to uh, gather together a final rebellion and that final rebellion um is coming from those who have um lived in the flesh and those who choose to fall away and indulge the flesh at that time uh with satan's temptation and throttling their flesh sin nature uh, with his um various devices that will happen um and it's a picture of second kings where uh the, the glorious kingdom age um has a final reckoning of those who choose to rebel uh at the end of the kingdom age at the end of the millennial reign in this case uh, the end of the kingdom age typologically and as that happens uh the church we of course are protected against that final rebellion because we and the tribulation saints are of course um not subject to temptation any longer because we're in our resurrection bodies um, we're not subject to the second death any longer uh, so it won't affect us but those who are in the flesh who get lured and tempted away sadly um, for them it will be a big problem okay and then uh so after that happens after uh satan's final rebellion and god sends fire down from heaven and consumes them and they're all cast into the lake of fire well what happens um uh before that lake of fire moment of final judgment well what happens in revelation chapter 20 what's the very next thing that it says books are opened well if you look at first chronicles what is chronicles it's a book and the books are opened and the books that are opened there as a record of every single person who's ever lived throughout time and they're judged according to what's written in the books now what does this represent well books are opened of all those who've lived from adam all the way up until the time of christ because first chronicles starts with 
If you open it up and you look at First Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. And then it goes into all the genealogies of all the um, tribes, uh, the table of nations, all the tribes of Israel, and each, of course, all the different 70 that came from Israel, they're representative of the 70 nations that were found in Genesis 10. And so it's basically a picture of First Chronicles, uh, the first several chapters, is a picture of all the names of every single person who's ever been born, from Adam all the way up to Christ, because First Chronicles goes from Adam all the way up to King David, who is a type of Christ. And so if you look at First Chronicles from that perspective, you'll see that um, it's a picture of books being opened, and everything that was written of every person and every name that's in there, and all that, all that you have in there, is a picture or a type of everybody who's ever lived from Adam up until the time of Christ's ministry. And those people are judged according to what's written in the books. In other words, did they live their life in a faithful manner? Were they expecting and anticipating a Messiah? Did they have a faith and a belief in God, even though they didn't know the name Jesus Christ yet? Even though um, they didn't understand um, the full picture of God's plan of salvation for them yet, did they live a life in anticipating God's promises to restore and redeem men uh, through his mis promised Messiah? And if they did, um, then in that sense, their name is written in the book of life, which is uh, the next book. And so books are opened for judgment, and we participate in this judgment of those who have died outside of faith. And so that's us during this time. It says even that we're going to participate in this judgment and we're even going to judge the angels themselves is going to be um, part of the, the thing that one of the things that the church does. And so um, as you see this play out, uh, we're going to have to go to one last slide here and see the final uh, stages of progression here. And that is in Second Chronicles where another book is opened, which is the book of life uh, to judge all those from Christ to the end of the millennial reign. And so if your name is not found in the book of life, you're cast into the lake of fire. And so what is a, how do you get your name in the book of life? Well, you believe in Jesus. That's how you get your name in the book of life, is if you believe in Christ. And so from for all the people who've lived from the time of uh, the, the conclusion of Christ's ministry in the church age, all the way up until the end of the millennial reign, if you believed and maintained your, in, your belief and confession in Christ uh, during the time of your life, then your name is in the book of life. You're not subject to the second death. You're not subject to the lake of fire. And you um, pass. Now, if your name is not in the book of life, then everybody who lived during that age, of course, is cast into the lake of fire. And judgment from heaven um, uh, passes over those who are in Christ. And the church, of course, escapes judgment through Christ. And everybody else is going to be living... Um, in the eternal state of separation from God in the lake of fire, uh, those whose names are not in the book of life, in the Lamb's book of life. Okay, so uh, you can see that Second Chronicles, uh, what does that start with? It starts with the transition from David to Solomon, like the millennial reign, and then it goes from Solomon all the way uh, to the end of the kingdom age. Um, so it's a picture or a type. Um, as Second Chronicles goes from Solomon Start, Solomon starts to reign uh, throughout the entire process of the entirety of the kingdom age, prefiguring the millennial reign. It's a picture of all those who've lived from the time of Christ at, at the end of David's reign and Solomon taking over all the way to the time of the end of the kingdom age, where um, everything is judged when books are opened and the great white throne judgment commences. And so when you see that happening, um, that's what the picture and the typology of that is. And so when you see that happening, you what is the next thing? What happens after the kingdom age? Um, after the captivity and all that is, is uh, over with? Well, you have um, a, a restoration, and only the faithful are part of that restoration. So you could kind of think of that Babylonian captivity and all of that stuff and the Assyrian um, captivity where they were... Uh, or, 
all the northern tribes were taken captive into um, and dispersed and scattered throughout the world. And then the Babylonian captivity where everybody was taken into Babylon. And then those who were released, remember they were all allowed to come back, but only 50,000 of them roughly uh, came back. And so it's much smaller, but it's only the, um, the true faithful ones uh, who came back. And what is that a picture of? Well, in Revelation 21, what happens? It tells us that God tabernacles or temples directly with us because there is no temple anymore. Um, there's no temple at that point because God tabernacles directly with his people um, at that time. And then, of course, you have God is, is the temple that we dwell with directly. Again, notice how the X and the Y axis, again, they keep they started to converge at this point uh, because God has reconciling all things to himself through Jesus Christ. And of course, we are part of that as the church tabernacling directly with God through Christ at this point. And so what happens next in Revelation 21? What do you have? The very next thing is you have the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. It, this is going to be the physical or metaphysical, if you prefer, a dwelling place of the church and all God's faithful and new Jerusalem descends out of heaven to earth. New Jerusalem descends out of heaven to earth. Again, the convergence there. And we dwell in the new Jerusalem um, with God as our, as our temple and Christ as, as his lamp uh, directly. And so uh, you could see that how this uh, perfectly, again, uh, pictures the, the Bible book order is perfectly mirroring the stage of progression of not only each individual believer, but also corporately the church at large, Israel corporately, and also um, the, the corporately the whole church and individually each member of the church. Everybody goes through this stage of progression and will go through this stage of progression, the next stages of it. And what's last is in the history is the book of Esther. And so what happens in the book of Esther? Well, essentially you have the king of the whole world. He was called Ahasuerus, uh, or you know, people debate about who it actually was, Artaxerxes, Ahasuerus, or if these were titles or names. You know, there's debate about that. But what was one of his titles in the book of Esther? He ruled over 127 provinces. Well, this is very interesting. If you take that number and you put it into binary, 127 is the fullness of 7-bit binary. So 7 being the number of completion in Scripture and a fully, uh, fully populated binary, a 7-bit binary, will give you the number 127. And so King Ahasuerus, he's tied, one of his titles is the King of Kings, and he rules over 127 provinces of the world. That's another way of saying he rules over the entire world. And so uh, who, who is that a typology of? Well, it's a typology of God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, um, his son, ruling and reigning as king of kings over the entire world. And who is he ruling with? He's ruling with his queen, which is a picture or type of Esther. Uh, Esther is a type, again, of the church ruling and reigning with Christ. For all eternity, ruling and reigning, ruling and reigning over eternity, and so uh, as you see uh, this progression play out, this entire progression um, repeats itself after a five-book interlude of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. There's that's a five-book poetic um, interlude, uh, which kind of tells that whole story over again from different poetic perspectives. And then uh, you have this entire progression happen again in a, another 17 stage of books, Isaiah through Malachi. And it goes book by book in the exact same thematic progression as Genesis through Esther in the same exact order, the canonical Bible book order that we have. And then guess what happens? You have five books again, an interlude of the action, the actual um, crux of the whole story, the climax of the whole story in Christ coming in the flesh and the gospel, the good news of him coming to die for us in our place for our sins on the cross, shedding his blood with his broken body on the cross, 
uh, which makes a way for us to be saved and redeemed. And that is told through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And then that Gospel message, which is recounted there, is, of course, carried out to the whole known world in the book of Acts. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts is like the picture of the four Gospels, with Acts being the Gospel, it, that Gospel message going out to the ends of the earth. And then you have another 17-stage progression, Romans through Second Peter, and it goes in the exact same order. The exact same order. Romans through Second Peter, 17 epistles, the exact same order, uh, thematically speaking. And then you have uh, five books um, capping off the Bible, a first, second, third John, Jude, and Revelation. And what I call these books is Preparation for Eternity, if you read those books, uh, any mature Christian uh, should read those books and read them frequently because they help us to um, get ready, receive full and complete sanctification, um, live essentially sin-free lives, and uh, of course not 100% perfect, but as close to perfect as possible, living sin-free lives and staying in right relationship with him and uh, sanctification and living in holiness with him anticipating his imminent return and so those last five books is like another interlude but it's the interlude between his written word and the consummation of the age and all the things that are going to happen that the book of revelation um, details and so it's kind of like the interlude between um, us awaiting his imminent return and us um, experiencing his imminent return and the kingdom age and eternity and so um, if you see that if you start to see this structure it helps you understand the way that the Bible is ordered parsed and indexed into its the volumes of books the order of books the chapters and verses are all part of it and um, I hope it edifies you of course you don't need this study to understand the Bible um, you don't need to understand this in this way to understand the basic message of salvation or the basic plan that God has, but this is a way to understand it at a deeper level. Um, and so the term metacosm, if you think of a microcosm, cosm just means world. So it's like the whole world, and if you have a microcosm, it's like a, a miniature of that world. So if you think of it like um, basically a, um, a single cell, is like a micro of an, a whole living organism. Okay, like a person is made up of a whole bunch of little individual cells. And so the person is like um, the world, and the cell is like the micro. So you might think of it as macro and micro. And then if uh, you think about it like this, um, you know, an atom is like the micro, and the universe is like the macro. And so if you think about it like that, uh, micro and macro, then you can think of Isaiah as a microcosm because it's 66 chapters outline the 66 books of the Bible. So you can think of Isaiah as the micro and the whole Bible as the macro. And so where do we get meta from? What is metacosm? Well, cosm means world. Meta means beyond. In other words, what this is all describing, this progression that we've gone through step by step, sliced up in time slices like this, this progression is like a meta. It's, it's leading us somewhere. It's leading us into the beyond world. Okay, so what the observable world, the universe, the creation that we see is in a fallen state. So that's like the macro. Um, we are kind of like the micro going through this process and ultimately it's all leading us to the meta the beyond uh beyond what we see here uh into the eternal realm and so uh that's what this study is titled that's why it's titled that because jesus is really um the microcosmic representation of his metacosmic self so let me say that again jesus uh, when he came in his earthly ministry he came kind of as a micro cosmic representation of his meta cosmic self. In other words, he came in the flesh, he emptied himself, and um, he submitted himself, 
even unto death, even the death of the cross, as uh, Philippians, um, of course, goes over. But he did all that so that he could tr translate us from this fallen world into the metacosm, the beyond world, the uh, heavenly realm, the eternal realm. Uh, so he did that for us. And so um, that's why uh, this study is called Metacosm. Uh, that's the reason for the title. And uh, there's a whole bunch more in the book. So uh, if you're interested in it, um, I do hope that you uh, you uh, get a copy of it. If you would like a free copy of it, I am always glad to um, email you the digital copy for free. All you got to do is send me an email and you can uh, get a free PDF copy of this. Uh, if you want to read it for free, you can just email me. My email will be in the description uh, below. And so you can uh, email me and I'll be glad to send you a free PDF copy. You can also get it on lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com. You can download a free PDF copy from there, or uh, you can buy a hardcover or paperback copy there on lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com. So if you are like me and you like to actually have a printed copy in your hand that you can open and read like a book instead of scrolling through it on a digital version, uh, you're welcome to uh, also uh, purchase a um, copy, uh, either a paperback or hardback copy from lulu.com, L-U-L-U.com, or uh, I think you can also get it on uh, you should also be able to get it on anywhere where they sell books like Amazon.com, uh, BarnesandNoble.com, BN.com, or eBay.com. Uh, you can go to any of those sites if you have a, if you prefer to uh, use those sites uh, to purchase things like that. Um, it's also available there. So I hope this study has edified you um, and blessed you and given you a deeper insight to God's Word. And that it helps you understand that God is not just the author of his word. He's also the architect and engineer of the design and structure of his word. The order of books, the chapters and verses, how it's indexed and parsed, everything. It's been perfectly designed and detailed by him um, without uh, any error whatsoever. It's, it's perfect and it's uh, absolutely um divine in nature and so uh, our understandings of it are even with this understanding of it we, we still just basically uh, tapping the surface of how deep it goes and how perfect it is so um, I hope this study has blessed you and um, I will be doing uh, more uh, presentations like this on this channel I welcome all the new people who are here to this channel I hope if you uh, haven't done so already, if you would subscribe, like the video, share the link out with other people uh, so they can be edified and blessed by it as well. And we'll see you uh, here, there, or in the air, or in the next video. God bless.